Next year, which is now, we're starting now. We are going to get into the year, the Hebrew year on God's calendar is the year 5,717. Five is the number of grace. 777, I think you know, triple completion. May mean the completion of the age of grace. Also, we don't tend to write our years fully, neither do the Jews. They abbreviate it, so they don't usually say the five, because there's always five. Five starts with 5,000. So they drop that, so the year on their system is the year 777. I mean, if God is into numbers and if He likes patterns and prophetic things, which He evidently does, it's going to be the year 777, starting now. The year of the Messiah according to the Jews. Now, unfortunately, for the Jews who don't yet believe the New Testament and that the Messiah came the first time, they're going to be looking for the wrong Messiah. They will momentarily put their faith and trust in a counterfeit Messiah. But we pray for them that the gospel will reach them. But they believe this coming year, this year that we're in, is the year for the Messiah to show himself. Revelation 12 says, now a great sign. Everyone say great sign. Great sign. We might say, no sign has been called great in the Bible. This is called great sign. Mega sign. We might say this is the greatest sign because no other celestial sign has been given more attention and more detail. We gloss over it. We read it very quickly. We're not going to do it today. Let me show you why it's very important because the time may be very soon. Well, the time is definitely very soon for this to be fulfilled. Now, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. This does not refer to a woman floating through the sky. The simplest, most literal interpretation of this is the constellation Virgo, which will have the sun at her head, the moon at her feet, and 12 stars, nine from the constellation Leo, and a conjunction of Mercury, Mars, and Venus on her head that makes 12 stars on the 23rd of September, 2017. Remember that date, 23rd of September, 2017. Remember that date, 23rd to 24th. The date in the Hebrew calendar starts from nightfall of the 23rd to nightfall of the 24th. Their days start from night, goes to day. Our day goes from day to ends at night, right? Because when you're Gentile and you don't know God, you, you start in the light and you head to darkness. But when you're the people of God, you start in the darkness and you head towards the day. Make sense? Okay. Now, how rare is this? Well, this hasn't happened before in our lifetime. In fact, the last time it happened was 5,932 years ago, and that would be on our Gregorian calendar, the 5th of August, the year 3,915 B.C., Roughly the time when Adam and Eve walked the earth. So this sign, the last time it appeared, seems to match when Adam and Eve were taught about how the woman would go into labor pain when she gives birth and that the serpent would bruise um, her seed's heel, but her seed, the coming Messiah, would bruise his head. Remember that? Okay, we'll come back to that. But when that was being told... And he was also being told, God said, that the stars and the sun and the moon are given for Moedim, for appointed times. When that was being told, there was a sign in the sky that looked like this, and it ha hasn't happened since. It's about to happen in less than 360 days. So let's map it out. You know that we've talked about the four blood moons plus the other two eclipses. All right, the four blood moons started on Passover, 15th of April, 2014. And two days before this great sign of the woman in the sky, clothed with the sun in her hair, the moon at her feet, 12 garland of 12 stars by her head, right? Two days before that is the Feast of Trumpets. Feast of Trumpets is, we just learned, prophetically, the next thing Jesus will fulfill. He fulfilled four feasts. The next feast, the fifth feast, he, he must fulfill. The next event should be the resurrection of the dead and the rapture of the saints, so if it were to happen, it should happen on the Feast of Trumpets. Next Feast of Trumpets will start, there's a two-day leeway, 20 to 22nd of September. If you count those two dates, the distance between those two dates, anyone want to guess the distance between those two dates? From the first lunar eclipse, blood moon, to the Feast of Trumpets next year, 2017, there are, you know this number, 
Isaac Newton cared about it. Lots of other godly people tried to calculate it. 1,260 days. I'm not making this up. You punch it in the calculator. This is written in the skies. If you want a sign, this is not religious. This is not bogus. This is not something made up. This was pre-planned when God put the stars into orbit. This was pre-planned so that it would spell out 1,260 days, a number we've seen many times. Revelation 12, a woman fled into the wilderness where God had prepared a place to care for her for 1,260 days. And again, I think those would be repetitive. You say, why does it appear there? Because I think it's the first set. Then there'll be another set. Then there'll be another set. All right? So now, take the distance from the woman in the sky. Now, the woman in the sky, she's got all these signs, plus she's to give birth. Remember that? In Revelation 12, she's supposed to give birth. Well, if you're supposed to give birth around that date, then something significant should happen nine months before. It's called conception. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to give you the date. Count nine months from the 23rd of September, and let's just see if anything happens. Put it on your calendar. All right? Around that time, we should see a conception, which is the 23rd of December, 2016. I have a friend who does YouTube. Um, you can go to his channel called The Cutting Edge 2, and he puts the date even earlier, and he says the conception is 20th of November, and that's based on him drawing lines on the constellation. I don't know if we can draw lines in the sky like that, but I'm just going to do it very simple. Nine months. Nine months. 23rd of December. Hey, guys, are you planning to be here for 50 years? Are you living like you got another... 30 years to go? I never predicted when the rapture is going to happen. I'm not a date setter. I'm showing you patterns and fulfillments, a very likely fulfillment of Revelation 12. Let's do another one. If you do eight months from the Feast of Trumpets, which is uh, possibly can start on the 20th of September, eight months, come on, count it. Where does it go to? Eight for the number of a new beginning? Very uncanny, a very interesting date. All of you should know. Eight months earlier from that date, the new president takes office, 20th of January, 2017. There are just layers upon layers upon layers, okay? But let's not just look at pictures, okay? I want you to um, go to the Word with me. Now, I'll show you what uh, Jacko Prinsloo he wrote this in a book called God's Roadmap to the End. And again, he has this uh, YouTube channel. Uh, I believe it's called The Cutting Edge, Cutting Edge 2. Um, he calculated this, so I'm just going to say it to you, okay? So here's the sign of the woman in the sky. Many of us prophecy teachers are all in agreement right now that this is the only thing going on in the sky for 6,000 years that would even fulfill, that could fulfill Revelation 12. Jupiter, which is the largest planet in our solar system, is called the king planet. It is the symbol of the king himself. Jupiter enters into the abdomen or the womb of Virgo. Celestially speaking, diagram, by diagram we're speaking, okay, because there are no lines in the sky. If we drew these lines, Jupiter enters the womb on 20th of November 2016. Maybe that's conception. Exits from Virgo... Okay, so that means if you could draw a line in the sky, leaves the womb on the 9th of September, 2017. Could be the birth, okay? Could be the rapture of the church, for instance, according to Jacko Prinsloo's model, okay? And the fulfillment of Revelation 12 would occur between the 23rd to the 24th of September, 2017. Oh, we got another thing. It's it just layer upon layer. On that date there is a comet that will conjoin with the moon. I don't know if we can ever get more of a sign since Adam and Eve, all right? What is this comet about? Well, I was thinking, should I share this? And it was in the news today. Can you imagine? I'm looking at this comet, and it's in the news today, like when you got up this morning. So I thought, okay, I'm going to have to share about this comet. Listen to how weird this comet is. It happens to be a comet that the European Space Agency decided to, to send a space probe to 12 years ago. I'm not making this up. On the 2nd of March, 2004, 
Europe launched the Rosetta space probe to rendezvous with Comet 67. Hey, ha when have we seen 67 before? 1967? Prophetic? Jerusalem was captured, 50th anniversary. It is called a Jupiter family comet. I looked that up. It's a Jupiter family comet. doesn't mean that it's related to Jupiter. It's just by their you know, uh, astronomical definition. It is a Jupiter family comet. Again, Jupiter representing the king. It's traveling at 38 kilometers per second, and we manage to rendezvous with it at 38 kilometers per second. That's pretty cool. On the 10th of September 2014, Rosetta entered the comet's orbit. On the 12th of November, Rosetta's lander, Philae, which means friend, like Philadelphia, touched down. We sent a probe that touched down on this comet. And yesterday, the 30th of September 2016, Rosetta crash landed on the comet, ending its 12 year mission. And I'm preaching about it today. On the 23rd of September next year, this comet that has been singled out by the European Space Agency, that has a peculiar name that rhymes with 1967, will be in conjunction with the moon, passing by the foot of Virgo 50 years. That's one jubilee. 50 years since 1967. What does it mean? I don't know. But this is my friend Lou Vega. He put this up on his website, postscripts.org. I thought, it's in the news. It's another celestial sign. You couldn't get more signs. As long as you live, I don't think there'll be a bigger sign than what's coming up. So, Revelation 12, let's read it, okay? I'll read it for you. We've got a few scriptures to show you because what we want to do now is to harmonize the scriptures. What does all this mean? Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain. Remember that? In labor and in pain. So what we want to do is to find out any other woman crying in labor and in pain in the Bible. To give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. This is the part we have ignored. We haven't talked about what is the dragon. We've talked about the virgin. We'll talk about the child. We haven't talked much about the dragon. What does he do? His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Hey, where have I heard that before? How about the rest of Revelation? If you studied my four hours of the 22 future events of Revelation, we know there's going to be meteor shower at the end of the sixth seal, and there's going to be meteor impact in the trumpet uh, judgments, and there's going to be more meteor impact in the bowl judgments. Where are all these meteors coming from? Revelation 12 says, when all these signs are happening, something will pass by and draw a third of the stars and throw them down to the earth. Well, these are not stars like the sun and you know, uh, big stars like that. If you throw the sun onto the earth, the earth would vanish because the sun is much larger. These stars falling to the earth can only be meteorites because we call meteorites falling stars. Can you see Revelation starting to make sense now? So something comes that we haven't talked about, draws all of these debris into the earth's atmosphere and starts pelting the earth totally in line with what the 22 predicted events of Revelation are. Revelation continues, She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and His throne. Where have I heard the word caught up before? Rapture. So now we have a sign in the sky. We have something that's going to dis disturb some debris, some meteorites or asteroids that will help fulfill the rest of Revelation. And around that time, there's somebody that gets caught up. So the question is, who? Who gets caught up? Many theologians debate about this. I want to try to clarify this right now. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared to God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. There is both an earthly meaning and a heavenly meaning for these scriptures. Right? Often dual application. We're going to first start with the heavenly meaning since we've been talking about signs in the sky, celestial signs. The woman is a collective entity referring to Israel. Is that correct? Most people believe, correct? Theologians believe the woman represents Israel. Israel is a 
body of people represented by one symbol, the woman. The dragon is a collective entity. Who is it that will go after the woman? Talking on the earth right now, actually. Talking about the earth. The Jews will flee from the Antichrist's armies. The beast system, the new world order that will be anti-Semitic, that will go against the Jews, they will come collectively, chase the Jews, and they'll find a safe place in Jordan, in Petra, in the wilderness. Cor correct? So the woman is collective. The dragon is collective. Now the question is, who's the child? And many people have taught, and I heard my, my wonderful pastor 20 years ago had a great pastor who taught end times to us, lived in New York, taught end times to us, but he taught in the light that he knew. I don't call him a false prophet because he didn't get everything right. I believe that every, everyone is progressing in their knowledge. And as we get closer to the end time, we stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before us. And this is what I, I really dislike about these keyboard warriors on YouTube and on social media. Because they disrespect those who have revelation. They disrespect anyone who might have gotten anything wrong. And they apply this false label and this false standard of perfectionism on them. I can say that my old pastor did not get everything about end times right. He did not know what this was. He said that the child must be Jesus. But if you harmonize the scriptures and you apply strict Bible interpretation, you've got one collective entity, another collective entity. How could the third thing be an individual? Not only that, the child should be a collective entity, which is the church, and it says the child is caught up. In other words, the church is raptured. How could it be Jesus that was caught up because Jesus was never caught up to be protected from the devil pursuing him? Jesus never ran away from the devil. Jesus defeated the devil. And in victory, he ascended to heaven. It's a completely different picture from this picture where Satan spews after the woman and the child that was given birth from the woman. Who? The church came from the Jewish religion. All of the early Christians were Jewish people. All the apostles, all the writers of the New Testament were Jewish. The Jews gave birth to the church. But when the devil comes in the time of wrath, of tribulation, the church was caught up. So this scripture seems to peg the Revelation 12 sign with the rapture of the church. Am I saying it has to be next Feast of Trumpets? Of course not. I'm not a date setter. But I'm saying it would behoove the church now to wake up. If we are called the ten virgins who are asleep, I am sounding the trumpet. Church, wake up. The bridegroom is coming. If it takes three and a half years for him to come, if it takes another seven years, I'm telling you it's time to live like he's coming very soon. But very likely we have a fulfillment of Revelation 12 next year. The wilderness is Petra, Jordan, lots of other scriptures to harmonize with that. I can't do it right now. We've got lots of other end-time teachings that cover that. Okay, now let's harmonize it with some scriptures. Can we do that? I've saved this for a long time. Let's do it, okay? Genesis chapter 3. Where do we find a woman who was in travail, in labor pain? Go all the way back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 3, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Who's her seed? The Messiah. Who's your seed, the serpent's seed? The Antichrist, who's also called in Revelation, the dragon. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Interesting. If these are signs in the sky, we've got a lot of description about what's going to happen up above our head. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. So let's look at the heavenly meaning now of Revelation 12. The woman, the only woman in the sky is the constellation Virgo. The woman's seed is the king planet Jupiter, the child that enters her womb and exits. And by the way, it never happens before. Jupiter stays in the womb for over 10 months. That's like the longest gestation period allowed. Jupiter would normally just pass right through. But next year, when Jupiter enters from November this year, Jupiter will go round and round and round and round like a little baby and will not exit the womb of Virgo until this sign is fulfilled. Strange, strange things. Look up, Jesus said. When all these things happen, he said, look up. 
Wonder why he said that. Satan's seed is the dragon. And I would say right now it's the unknown object. Nobody knows. We know there's another element to this prophecy, but we're not sure. And many people are calling it Planet X. I think that's a valid conjecture because somebody, some other planet came during the time of Jesus' crucifixion and blocked the sun for three hours. The moon cannot block the sun for even eight minutes. Seven minutes and maybe like 30 seconds is max. Another object blocked the sun when Jesus was crucified. So there's a celestial sign at Jesus' birth. There's a celestial sign at Jesus' crucifixion, and we believe there's a celestial sign at the next appointed time, which should be the rapture and the start of the tribulation. And then bruising the head and, and him bruising the heel is very interesting because if you put these things as an interpretation of things going on in astronomy in the sky, that would mean the top side of an unknown object collides with the southern hemisphere of Jupiter, resulting in a stream of debris. Now, when we come up with these theories, we always go to history. History is prophecy. Patterns are prophetic. Well, guess what? It happened already. Did you know that Jupiter was grazed by comet Schumacher. Schumacher. You know what that means? Shoemaker. And what are you supposed to hit? The heel. And the shoemaker hit the heel of the king planet once before. So what happened? Comet Shoemaker Levy 9 broke apart in July 1992. Its fragments collided with Jupiter on the southern hemisphere between the 16th to the 22nd of July, 1994, at a speed of 60 kilometers per second. The prominent scars from the impacts were visible from Earth and persisted for months. This happened before. Remember, patterns are prophetic. History is prophecy. Schumacher might be prophetic of an outline of the king's heel. How amazing is God? All these names, I believe, are prophetic. So what is the sign telling us? Harmonize it with Jeremiah. Let's see what happens when a woman is in labor. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. So why do I see every man with his hand on his loins like a woman in labor and all faces turn pale? What is Jeremiah chapter 30 talking about? You're going to recognize this right away. Alas. For that day is great, so that none is like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. What's he talking about? The woman in labor, which we find in Revelation 12, is explained in Jeremiah 30 as the start of the time of Jacob's trouble. How long does that last? Again, most American prophecy teachers believe seven years, so you just do the math. 2017 plus seven means... 2024 would be around the time when Jesus would come back for the Jews. I personally believe that it is possible the time of Jacob's trouble equals the time of the real Jacob's trouble. And his time of trouble was not seven years. His time of trouble for, for his two wives, for Laban's sheep and goats, and for running away from Esau, all of that added up to the number of the Jews, 22. So 2017 plus 22 would equal 2039. I don't know. I don't know if we can survive that long. Today, our anniversary service. Today, the start of the new year on the Jewish calendar. Today, the internet has been given up by the United States and handed over to the UN. You know why? You know why? Because the United States has one law called the First Amendment which protects free speech. As long as the internet is in the United States' power, it's always protected by the First Amendment. You can say whatever you want. But if you remove it from the legal structure and protection of the First Amendment and give it to the UN, you can begin to censor people who speak opinions the globalists don't agree with. It happened today. How long can we go? Can we go to 2040? I don't know. I think it'd be tough. It'd be tough. I am now more inclined, even though I believe in the 22 years, I believe the 22 years of Jacob's trouble already started. Okay, but... Another time we can study that. Saved out of it. He will go into the time of Jacob's trouble. Israel will, but he will be saved out of it. What does that mean? The Messiah will bring them salvation 
out of the tribulation. Jeremiah 30 pegs the Revelation 12 sign to the beginning of Jacob's trouble and then the salvation of the Jews. Another one, Isaiah 21. A distressing vision is declared to me. A treacherous, the treacherous dealer deals treacherously, and plunderers plunder. Go up, O Elam, beseech, O media, all its sighting I have made to all its sighing I have made to cease. Therefore, my loins are filled with pains. Pangs have taken hold of me like the pangs of a woman in labor. I was distressed when I heard it. I was dismayed when I saw it. This is Isaiah 700 years before Jesus came. And he said, when he gave this metaphor of being in labor and in pain, he said, Elam and Media come and attack. Who's that? The woman in labor is interpreted by Isaiah as being associated with the invasion by Elam and Media, which, if you studied my 4,000 years of history, you know is Iran. So the Iranian invasion we covered in World War III series refers to Daniel chapter 8, a war between Iran and the Sunni Muslims, and Ezekiel 38, a war of the United Muslims against one nation, Israel. There are two wars that Iran seems to be involved with, and when the sign of the woman in the sky comes, when the woman is in pain, Isaiah calls, O Elam, O Media, come out and begin your siege. Begin your war. I think this might be the last one. Isaiah 13, verse 8. There's quite a few, but I'm just giving you harmony of scriptures. That's how you understand the Bible. Don't make it up. Let the Bible speak for itself. It will interpret itself. Chapter 13, verse 8 of Isaiah. And they will be afraid. Pangs and sorrows will take hold of them. They will be in pain as a woman in childbirth. They will be amazed at one another. Their faces will be like flames. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel and bo with both wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. So in this case... In this case, the woman that is in labor and the other celestial signs are associated with the day of the Lord, and that's the wrath of God on sinners during the tribulation. So again, what does Revelation 12 tell us? If you harmonize the Scriptures, it's looking more and more like it's associated with the beginning of the day of the Lord. That's called the tribulation. All right. So here it is. There's the sign. And here's my last scripture. This is what, in plain English, I believe is happening soon. Verse Corinthians 15. Couldn't be plainer than this. 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, this, Im this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Therefore, what do we do? My beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable. What does immovable mean? Don't shift and change and shift and change which is what I see all the time now. People shifting and changing all the time. Be immovable in this time. I have the same job for 16 years. I think very few people can boast that in this generation. I have kept the same job and I have pastored the same church for 16 years. What does that mean? Immovable. People have come and gone. People have rejected me, criticized me. Immovable. Movable. Why? Because I know the time is near. Immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Do you know that when I was teaching this, a young person with no theological qualification, no training, doesn't win anyone to the Lord, criticized me and said, oh, you're, you know, you're too much about ministry, too much about working for God, too much about doing tasks for, for God. It's, it's, that's not what Christianity is. And I said, God, you know, I want to listen to everybody, even the ones who are not qualified, even the ones who have no fruit. I just wonder maybe if God is speaking to me. And I said, God, you've got to show me. He said, open to 1 Corinthians 15. 
And I read, here's the trumpet sounding, here's the rapture. And I said, so what, God? He said, keep reading. And then he said, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I said, wow, this is tied directly to the resurrection of the dead and the rapture of the church. When are we supposed to work for God? When are we supposed to be crazy about doing things for the church? When else but in the last days? And so let him make fun of you. I will always be abounding in the work of the Lord. You know, I was in five cities in two weeks. Five cities. You think that's easy? You think that's fun? Eat all kinds of different food. You're in different weathers. You're on different flights. It's not fun. Always abounding. Why do I do it? Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why do I do that? Knowing. You've got to know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your labor in the world will be in vain. You'll be burned up one day. But your labor in the Lord. I didn't say you have to become all ministers. You can be working in business. But you share Jesus now. You invite people to church now. You tell the gospel. You pray for their soul now. Especially the ones who hate you. Especially the ones who are giving you lots of trouble. You're not alone. All of us are going through it. The world is crazy right now. The devil is about to unleash his wrath. We're out of here soon. Whenever it happens, doesn't matter. Abound in the work of the Lord, knowing your labor is not in vain in the Lord.